why, again, this video lecture and your assigned reading are the foundation for a discussion post in a module in the course. The list of sources, as usual, is found in the To Learn More link on Canvas. And this video lecture in particular also supports the work that you're going to be doing on the Structural Edit project. So let's get going. This lecture is going to do three things. Explain the role of quality assurance in industry. Explore how tech editing serves as a kind of quality assurance. And explain the importance of structural editing in quality assurance. So let's begin with the role of quality assurance, or QA, in industry. Merriam-Webster defines the noun phrase quality assurance, as shown here. Think about an example. Airlines, to ensure quality, which for them would include safety, have specific employees at airports who monitor and evaluate their operations. The job title or business unit that those employees work in includes the phrase quality assurance. Turns out QA is important to all types of organizations. The International Standards Organization, or ISO, has provided a set of standards for assuring quality since 1987. More than 1 million organizations around the world are ISO 9001 certified. They spend time and money to get certified because quality processes help an organization do a variety of things. But let me give you one specific example. Clark County School District in Nevada used ISO 9001 to save $174 million over 10 years. More than 3,000 employees were trained in standard ways of monitoring and evaluating operations, and they cut that much in spending just by paying attention to quality processes. So given the importance of QA in industry, you might be wondering why everything industry produces isn't top quality. Well, the answer is neatly summarized in this figure, which displays what project managers call the triple constraints. Perfect quality would require unlimited scope and resources, so time and money. Simple example might make this more clear. So let's say you want to have a party to celebrate your graduation. The perfect party, highest quality, would require no limitations in scope, so you could invite any number of guests. You could choose any location you wanted. And the perfect party would also require no time limitations. So you have forever to get it planned and you can have it on any date you want. And finally, the perfect party would require no cost limitations. So you could spend any amount of money you want. Project managers are fond of saying that in reality, you can probably handle any two constraints but then you have to deal with the remaining one. So you can have a party that takes place next week with any number of guests if cost is not a constraint. Or you can have a cheaper party next week if you're unconstrained by location. But you're not going to get a party next week with unlimited numbers of guests that's also cheap. Organizations must constantly manage the constraints of time, money, and scope. I'll return to these triple constraints a bit later in the lecture. Let's talk about how tech editing adds value within organizations by implementing a type of QA. The question then is, how does tech editing systematically monitor and evaluate content to ensure that standards of quality are met? I think maybe a story is the best way to understand how this might work. Consider a case study that was published by Content Science about a company called Precore. They design and build premium exercise equipment. They had two primary business challenges in 2015. Precore's first challenge was created by their success. They grew by selling more equipment, more than 50 new products in just one year, 2015. That meant more employees and many of them were content creators. They were creating technical and marketing content for all those new products. 
that resulted in important customer-facing documents, like brochures, installation guides, that didn't always look like they were created by the same company. Precor's second challenge was also a result of their success. So much of their growth was international. That meant the cost of translation for all of that content was out of control. Global field marketers wanted to address specific content needs in their particular area. Doing this after translation was too late. That meant budget overruns as well as delayed, incomplete, and potentially inaccurate content that was released to international customers. So Precor's senior writer and content strategist, her name is Teresa Getz, believed that a new tech editing process was the key to overcoming these challenges. She got company management to allow the writing team to implement a rigorous editorial process that I'm showing you here on this slide. All content projects were assigned to an editor and then tracked in an online tool. Levels of edit were defined with input from all the right stakeholders, so design, legal, whoever. Appropriate reviewers were identified and trained, and finally, those reviewers were actually held accountable for quality on-time reviews of content. Precor implemented this create, edit, review cycle in their U.S. headquarters first, and then presented two webinars globally to train everyone on the new editorial process. After collecting data and tweaking the process, their trial was considered to be a resounding success. Teresa said the editorial process trial changed mindsets and behaviors in the company because it addressed both content quality and cost challenges. So the moral of Precor's story is that even though they're not a traditional publisher, Editorial work assured the quality of their content and created business value. Precor's editors performed systematic monitoring and evaluation of the various aspects of content that they produced to ensure that standards of quality were being met consistently. Tech editing certainly functioned as QA at Precor. The challenge in many organizations is that editors do not want to or know how to communicate the business value they bring to non-traditional publishers of content. So you should get ready for that challenge. I suppose it's obvious why traditional publishers paid editors. After all, the content they produce is the very heart of their business. A traditional publisher needs readers to see their content as professional, high quality, high value. I'm also certain you've noticed that the quality of news content, print news in particular, has changed. Most would agree the overall quality has declined. Although I'm certainly no expert on journalism, I believe the triple constraints can be used to explain the decrease. The desire to cut costs reduces the number of editors. And the rush to publish content reduces the time allowed for editing. Those constraints lead to lower quality. So let me diverge for just a minute to talk about the job outlook for editors because it reflects the value industry places on quality content. In the U.S., we predict a 4% increase in the number of all media and communication workers from 2018 to 2028. It's a significant contrast to the job outlook for tech writers, which is projected to grow by at least 8% over the same time period. And although it's not shown on this slide, the BLS predicts a 10% decline in the number of news reporters and a 3% decline in the number of general editors for the same time period. In addition to job availability, salaries for tech writers are higher than for other communication and media workers. Remember, many tech editors working for non-traditional publishers are former tech writers who moved into management. The point I want to make is that in 2020, the organizations who are willing to pay for quality content are primarily non-traditional publishers. So the pre-core case study should have clarified why non-traditional publishers are willing to pay to assure quality. As one tech editor wrote back in 1998, the business value created by a tech editor is related to critical product design goals. This type of QA doesn't focus primarily on copy editing or proofreading. 
instead structural editing that focuses on content and its organization and usability is what does things like reduce loss of reputation or reduce the cost of litigation or the cost of translation. That brings us to the third and final topic in this lecture. Your assigned reading for this module argues that technical editing can provide the same QA process for content that software QA testing does for code, but the authors really mean structural editing. Before I talk about structural editing in more detail, it's important to note that the authors of your reading, that's Corbin et al., I'm just going to say Corbin, use terms from the levels of edit differently than those I've adopted for our course. I created a table so that you could see the differences. When Corbin refers to comprehensive editing, they mean editing focused on content. The terminology I've borrowed is from the Editors Association of Canada. They use the term structural editing to refer to this focus on content, and the term comprehensive editing to refer to a focus on all the levels of edit at one time. Let's consider a few descriptions of quality assurance actions that involve structural editing. The Editors Association of Canada lists the items at left as central to structural editing. So things like assessing overall structure, reorganizing material, recommending content additions or deletions, those kinds of things. Corbin and the rest of the authors of that piece define structural editing this way. Technical accuracy, working toward the big picture, reducing unnecessary content. Although the lists are not identical, I hope that you see their significant overlap. Now let's look at some examples. The New York Book Editor's website has a terrific story about structural editing of this nonfiction book. The editor, Dan Chrisman, explains his overall impression of the manuscript sent by the author to the publisher. So Chrisman thought the material was worth publishing, but not in its present form. Here are some examples of what Chrisman actually wrote to the author, Paul Engel. Note the positive tone. All successful editors establish a good relationship with the authors of the content they edit. I'm going to have more to say about that in the next module. For now, I just want to point out that Chrisman doesn't criticize so much as predict the reader's response to the current manuscript and then describe how to alter that response so that the author, Engel, can achieve whatever his goals are. After Chrisman summarized his overall reaction and recommendation, he followed up with a detailed chapter-by-chapter -chapter plan for Engel's book. Here's how Engel responded. Here's another example of structural editing. This one involved me as the editor, actually a reviewer in this case. I was playing a role very similar to the role of a structural editor. The content I reviewed was a 61-page research proposal, not a book. Here's what I want you to notice. I offered genuine compliments and explained how I wanted the author to interpret my recommendations. Like Chrisman, I framed my recommendations for change within predictions of how readers would respond to the current manuscript. My job was to anticipate how ready, in other words, able and willing, readers would be to accept the content of the author's proposal. To maximize the likelihood of reaching her goal of winning support from them, I summarized what I believed was most important in terms of content development and then also with organization of that content. Throughout the rest of the author's manuscript, I added more specifics about the content and organization at appropriate locations. I did not copy edit because that was not appropriate at this stage of the process. I would have wasted time on style and mechanics of language or visuals that might well be reworked or totally deleted. Understanding what level of edit you're working at is imperative in order to be efficient. Copy editing might also have detracted from the focus on content and organization. So focusing on the appropriate level of edit also impacts editorial effectiveness. Before we leave this example, I should note you're seeing comments embedded into the Word file containing the author's manuscript. This is certainly standard practice in copy editing, but not so much in structural editing. There's a lot more narrative produced by the structural editor, so it doesn't usually fit neatly into the author's manuscript. 
and it requires a separate document, often in the form of a letter or a report. In this particular situation, my narrative was delivered in a face-to-face -face meeting with the author, where I repeated or expanded upon the comments in the margins of the manuscript. You can review a sample structural edit in the form of a letter on our Canvas site. As Norton says in his book on developmental, that's another term for structural editing, there's a line that structural editors are not supposed to cross. When they cross that line, they become authors. In later modules of the course, we'll see that this is actually just as true for copy editors as it is for structural editors. So now that you have a better understanding of what structural editing is, I want to say a few final words about its value as quality assurance for content producers. This table comes from the Editorial Freelancers Association. What I want you to see is that structural editing, which would include both developmental and maybe what they call substantive editing, has the highest estimated fee rate. The ability to help an author develop and organize content is ultimately more valuable than copy editing. In part, this is because of the level of knowledge needed by someone conducting a structural edit. But it's also because without effective content and organization, the most engaging style and flawless mechanics function like lipstick on a pig. To summarize the main points that I wanted to make in this video lecture, QA's purpose of monitoring quality is so important in industry that more than 1 million organizations have invested time and money in getting ISO 9001 certified. Second thing, tech editing serves a QA purpose by monitoring and evaluating content to ensure that standards of quality are met. Then third, the critical tech editing focus that supports QA is structural editing a focus on content development and on organization. Structural editing is something research has shown students are reluctant to do without encouragement or maybe prodding. That's why you complete a project that requires an edit at this level before you begin copy editing.